It's hard to differentiate. And so you really have to have a good story that resonates and they remember when you leave the room after a, after an interview. Episode 84. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture show. I hope that you've had a wonderful Thanksgiving or whatever part of the world you are. You're getting close to the holiday seasons upon us, the change of the new year, and things have been wonderful here on Business of Architecture. I hope things are going well for you as well. As you may have been aware, we recently had the Business of Architecture Summit. was very successful. You can go to Business of Architecture, and I've actually put up the recordings of those, so you can purchase those for a nominal fee a la carte. You don't have to buy the whole thing, or you can get a package deal and buy the whole entire summit. 12 hours of continuing education credits. And more importantly than that is cutting-edge business information that's going to help you start your firm, improve your business, make more profit, brought in a lot of industry experts. And so you're going to want to check that out over on Business of Architecture. Now, I want to remind you that support for the Business of Architecture show is provided by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice, the number one office and product management software for architects. And here's an exclusive offer for you, my loyal podcast listeners. Until December 31st, BQE is offering you the chance to win an all-new iPad mini when you attend a live demo. It's that simple. Now, this is a pretty good chance for you to win one of these iPad minis, but even better, this is a great chance for you to take a look at this revolutionary groundbreaking software that can help you run a more profitable and flexible practice. You can claim your demo by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo, but you have to do it before the end of the year. Once again, that's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. And in addition, you'll get the chance to win that iPad mini. I'm just stoked, as we say over here in California, to have my guest on the show today. Uh, the guest today is actually native Californian, Craig Park. He is... The, um, I'm going to talk to Craig today about some strategic in issues with marketing, business development. Craig is a principal with an independent technology consultancy firm, the Sextant Group, based out of Omaha, Nebraska. Now, Craig is a powerhouse in terms of his, his resume is literally, I think it's three or four pages long here. And he has a ton of experience. It's We're going to get have a great conversation here. I encourage you to um, take out your pen and paper if you're at a point where you can do so. Craig is an author and speaker. He's written the book, The Architecture of Value, Building Your Professional Practice in 2011, 2013, The Architecture of Image, Branding Your Professional Practice, Marketing Handbook for Design and Construction uh, Professionals. He was a contributing author, as well as the SMPS's Foundation's 2013 book, AEC Business Development. So, Craig, welcome to the show. Thanks, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Craig, you have a background and you are an architect. Right. Trained as an architect, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. Excellent. Which is not too far from where I'm at here. Yeah. yeah. But you have a long, long industry experience in the larger firm scene, which is great. It's good to have you on the show here. We've had a lot of smaller firm practitioners on the show. So it's good to bring someone in like yourself, Craig, who has this just broad experience of working with larger firms and doing larger deals and being involved in some cool stuff. Now, an interesting story that we were talking about is you worked on the Getty Center with Richard Meyer. Yes, I did. It was a wonderful project. Uh, started in 1989 and Opened in 1997. I, mean, I started working. I think Richard Meyer's firm started working in 1984. So think about your architectural uh, typical process of two to three years. That was a long, drawn out, extended process that had a lot of different elements to it. Wonderful project uh, experience. Lots of, uh, you know, lots of teams on that too. Many engineering firms, consulting firms. Uh, the client had multiple user groups that had, if you've ever been to the Getty, it's got five major building areas that, that had hold everything from administration to conservancy to the museum kinds of spaces. Uh, yeah, it really is more of a master plan city than a museum. Yeah. I don't know if there's, if I've ever seen a museum of that size and scope. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's you know, really the Getty Center, it's an education center. There are uh, scholars who work on art history uh, and conservancy there on an annualized basis, much like a uh, the Rome Prize when you get to go to work, work in Rome if you're an architect, uh, that kind of uh, event. So, uh, and a wonderful client because they 
you know, blessed with uh, the, the benefits of the Getty Trust uh, that could afford to build that building in 1997 when it opened. I think it was the largest uh, building project, close to a billion dollars uh, in the United States at that time. That's incredible. Well, Craig, you have an interesting story about how you ended up working on that project. Sure, I'd be happy to share that. We, um, I worked uh, for, I, so a little bit about my background. I am an architect by training, but I interned in my uh, junior year for a technology consulting practice like the Sexton Group, uh, a different firm than uh, no longer in existence. But uh, I was in LA and uh, I really liked the firm because their clients were all the different kinds of architectural practices I wanted to work for. And I ended up working for them after I got out of school. And when I first, um, after a few years, I was promoted to run their LA office. And one of the things you learn about marketing is um, you got to find work. You know, the phone doesn't automatically ring, as you know, and, and, and you tell your clients, uh, what do you do to, to make that happen? And um, I had read an article about the Getty being awarded. The Richard Myers firm had won the uh, competition for the project. And they had established a Los Angeles office. So I uh, drove down to Westwood and knocked on their door and uh, met the managing principal and said, you know, we're a unique technology firm and would like to be considered. And he said, absolutely, but it's way too early. Uh, keep in touch. And so I did over the years. I would send uh, interesting articles on projects we worked on. And then in a few years later, I changed firms. I moved to San Francisco, but I was always interested in that project. So I continued to stay in touch. And in 1990, uh, 1989, we received an RFQ uh, from the Getty themselves. The Getty uh, uh, Trust organization was heavily involved in consultant selection. And they uh, reached out to about 20 uh, technology firms around the country, many uh, uh, well-known museum exhibit designers and people that had worked on large museums. And because I had stayed in touch, we got a, a request for our information. And we put together our qualifications. And quite honestly, um, we had not done uh, a lot of museums. We had um, done a, a very interesting art exhibit space in the Hess Winery in Napa. It's one of the largest private collections of art. Uh, and it has a lot of technology that supports that uh, presentation. And we worked on the Bodine Sourdough Bread Museum in San Francisco. So not, it, you know, it doesn't really stand up there with a the Getty when you look at um, equals, but we had done a lot of work in Silicon Valley on high resolution imaging of graphics. And I knew in reading about the Getty that this was at the time Getty was developing Getty images, which if you use that as a resource, um, they were starting to collect imagery and share that with the world through the internet. So I knew that their IT and their CIO, their chief information officer, had a passion for digital imagery. Um, and so we uh, ultimately submitted our as you do, you would submit our statement of qualifications. And a couple of months later, we got a notification that we were one of six uh, at firms and that I was to come down. I was number four in the interview list, not the place you want to be. If you've done many interviews, you'd really like to be number one or number six in this case. You want to have the first impression or the last impression. Because the middle, when you look at our firms and professional services, architecture, engineering, construction, quite honestly, to most clients, we look the same. Uh, it's hard to differentiate. Um, and so you really have to have a good story uh, that resonates and they remember when you leave the room after, a, after an interview. So knowing that we had such limited museum qualifications, but had a lot of facilities designs that we'd worked on that had um, elements of high resolution uh, graphical imagery for companies like Apple, uh, IBM and, and uh, Oracle in those days. Um, early, the early Silicon Valley, the growth of Silicon Valley, where, where we were the heart of that. Um, I presented that as our qualifications in, in our 45-minute presentation, 15 minutes of Q&A, typical interview scenario. Um, and um, it was interesting because the, the selection panel was made up of three people from the Getty, the head of real estate, the chief information officer, and the Getty's project manager. And then the architectural side, Richard Meyer's office, was Michael Palladino, who's uh, the design director for the Los Angeles office of Richard Meyer. Uh, Don Barker, who was the managing principal, and Rick Irving, who was the uh, head of the interiors group in Meyer's office. Um, so the six of them, you know, they, uh, they listened to my presentation of background. They had a little of agenda. And then they asked a lot of questions. And the conversation went an hour. So I had a 45-minute, you know, uh, thing. And we were already at like an hour 15. 
Um, and I'm thinking, this is good. This is always a good thing when you run long um, <laughs> and you've engaged them in some way. And I will tell you that I knew one person on the selection committee. And I didn't know I knew that person until I walked into the room. The head of real estate was a gentleman named Kurt Williams. And he had been the head of uh, facilities and real estate at Stanford and had been my client on a project where I did the consulting for the Graduate School of Business at Stanford a few years prior. Mm. So we had a working relationship, and I knew he liked the work I did because um, it was at that time when I transitioned firms, and when I left the firm in L.A. to go to the firm in San Francisco, he insisted that the firm in L.A. continue to use me and subcontract the work for me on Stanford, even though I was no longer with their firm. So I stayed through the completion of the Stanford project. So we had a good working relationship. And, but needless to say, they, we, I, you know, the interview ran and the Getty people put their heads together. I watched them have a side conversation and they said, could you excuse us for a minute? And the Meyer people said, sure. And they got up and left. And I'm scratching my head and going, OK, what's this mean? Because um, I've never seen this before. And they were gone for a few minutes. And then they came back in and they said, you know, we've decided that we really like what Craig has said and what his firm does because he's illustrated in his projects and his process uh, a way about thinking about technology planning for, uh, for this building that we had not been exposed to before. Um, and we've looked through everyone else's qualifications and while they're all really good, no one speaks to what we want to achieve the way that he has. And so we've decided we're gonna hire him now. So you can cancel the last two interviews. Um, and, um, and fortunately, the, or unfortunately, the next, the fifth interview was the gentleman who I worked for, actually the president of the company um, I worked for in LA. He was from New York, but my former boss, um, and uh, who called me the next week and said he couldn't have been prouder that if he was going to lose it without ever getting interviewed, that I was the one who won. <laughs> good guy. Um, but, but it was a good case of uh, a marketing strategy that I, you know, that when you identify a client that you want to work with, the importance of getting to know what's important to that client. Um, as you send them information to keep them on, your, on their radar, keep you on their radar, uh, and to inform them about trends or, or information that will help them think about their project differently. Um, two, especially two, questions, two questions on that, Craig. Yeah, sure. What, tell me about the thought process of being able to understand so deeply your client, and then secondly, the thought process of innovation. So now you understand the need. How do you come up with that innovative solution? Okay, sure. Well, you know, we're, we're an interesting um, case and a niche within the architectural industry in that we are the technology for video and audio, how we communicate with media uh, in our spaces, how we collaborate. Um, and so if that's a good thing. If you're a generalist architect, it's a little harder to say, what am I going to do? You can still follow these same ideas. But um, I started reading about the Getty, what was what was uh, in the press, what was on there, um, what was available from them. They had an existing small museum. I don't know if you're aware of that, down in Malibu. Yep, yeah, been there. Uh, Beautiful. The old the uh, villa, Pompeii Getty Villa. villa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so I visited that, got the books on the Getty, um, read about that. And I started I realized that, you know, they were they had some published things about Getty images and the idea of having this collection of digital imagery that would be available on the internet. Uh, that was just starting in those days. If you think of this early 1990s um, uh, and, and 1980s, the internet really became public in the late 80s with, after DARPA. So um, we, because we were working with all of these companies in, in the Valley, Silicon Valley, that were also saying, we need to present better. Um, that was the innovation. We were going to be ahead of, uh, the Valley's always been ahead of the rest of corporate America uh, and corporate thinking, institutional thinking, about how to advance the experience of the visitor. Um, it's a really unique case um, uh, when you deal with uh, entrepreneurial thinking, and it's really true today as well. Uh, we have Google as a client, um, and seeing what they're doing around their facilities around the U.S., very similar. How can they're doing the same thing? How can we engage? Our, our experience or uh, provide an experience for our clients when they come to our facilities that reinforces our brand as innovators. So I took the same thought. What is it I can send to them? So I was sending them things about here are new facilities that these companies are building that exemplify this, um, uh, this way we communicate or way we collaborate on how we present and how we, uh, how we work. 
the, the Silicon Valley had started a process called executive briefings, where instead of you coming, uh, you um, uh, them coming to you to sell, uh, the way most of us do, go knock on the door and tell our story. Um, Silicon Valley had started a process of bringing the clients to them and have them experience what it's like at Apple. You know, a day in the life at Apple mm -hmm. or a day in the life at Oracle. Um, and that was a, a really interesting twist. So um, it was just a regular ongoing communication. Um, the innovation was, now you have to remember the timing of this, well, much of what we take for granted in technology, the ability that we have today to have this conversation over Skype, um, live, real time, um, was much harder to do in those days. Video conferencing had been around, but wasn't as robust. The network speeds were not necessarily guaranteed as they are today. But I knew that um, the, the guy named Bruce Briggs, who was the CIO, Chief Information Officer for the Getty, had come from UCLA, and I had friends at UCLA, and they had talked about how he had been in, engaged in upgrading the network at UCLA. So I knew network speed and network configuration, the IT side of what we do, the, the pathways in which all the signal travels, was an important aspect. Mm -hmm. So I started sharing information in our presentation um, about the, the trend towards optical fiber as the pathway, that we were not going to be on copper anymore. We were going to be transferred. So that just that one step. And I, now, quite honestly, I'm five years ahead of being able to do that when I'm saying this. So it's like the old AT&T commercials where they would show some science fiction room and they say, do you want to do this? Yes. Can you do it? No. When you will be able to do it, AT&T will do it for you. Mm. That was the, the model. Because we, we often talk in our practice um, as, as uh, technology visionaries about writing science fiction. Um, we, and we want to write, uh, tell stories that are true, but are just a stretch enough um, that a building that's being designed today will have this capability five years from now. That capability may not be available right now, but it will be at some point. And we want to plan the infrastructure to support that. So that's that's been the pitch all along. Uh, and what makes our little niche in the architectural industry so unique. Well, and you, you did mention something earlier that ties in well, I think, to what you're saying now, Craig, and that is the concept of a story. You said right. you need to have a story. And so what you just crafted for us was a story, talking about how you develop that story and how you paint a picture of something that happens in the future. Right. Well, and I think there's, a, there's an old saying that says, facts tell, but stories sell. Um, and many firms, when they market their practice, will go in and say, we're 100 years old, we have 500 people, we've done 10,000 projects, um, and, you know, 50 million square feet, and, you know, the client's going, yawn, um, so what? yeah. what's in it for me? So the stories are always about the, the challenge that was faced, the features of the solution, and the benefits, I think that's the most important part the benefits of that solution to the client. And when you can craft those together, and it, even more especially if you can have testimonials from that end user client about what that benefit was, where they're speaking to the benefit, that's a powerful um, advertising for your, the, your practice. And I see that in the better architectural firms uh, that we work with. We work with hundreds of firms every year. Um, and uh, and they all go through the same process of responding to an RFQ, uh, submitting their pretty book of great pictures and stories uh, in some fashion, and then having to get up and tell the story in front of a selection committee to win the work, and then ultimately negotiate a, an appropriate fee uh, for that work. I think you can you can speak to the small practices. We don't do a lot of work with you know the, the under 10 uh, population firms. We do some, but... Um, uh, but that's a process that's pretty common through the industry uh, for many projects, particularly in the larger public sector. Hey, Architect Nation, it is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at archeoffice.com. Now back to our show. Craig, as, as someone who isn't working cr currently in an architecture firm, but as an architect, you have, you're have uniquely positioned to be able to work with a lot of these different firms. Right. Could you talk to me about your perception 
of what these firms are doing well that you think others should be emulating? Sure. Um, I, when you look at the, the really exemplar firms, um, the ones are sharing uh, thought leadership. Um, they're providing information on their websites or through their various social media outreach programs on trends in buildings, uh, every, benchmark uh, uh, issues. Uh, a benchmark to me is a really key issue. When I can tell a client, if you're planning to do a new city library, here are the last five city libraries that have been done in the United States, and here's what they cost, and here are the features that made them unique and what their communities thought about them. Um, that gives a client a lot of confidence that you can replicate that experience with them, that they're not going to go down a rabbit hole of a over budget or, or overextended schedule uh, or a project that isn't actually what they, they met, uh, uh, wanted at the, at the time. So, uh, you look at the, you know, and, and I, you know, you, I don't want to rattle off all the names, but the, the top firms all share that common uh, model. If you look at their websites, you see that uh, uh, they share information well. They they focus on the visual imagery, but of their projects, um, we all, and I say we all in terms of the architectural industry, design beautiful buildings. Um, it's one of the things that keeps us in architecture, I think you would probably agree, is the experience of seeing what we have done uh, built uh, and standing in the landscape. Uh, there are so many bad uh, buildings out there done just, you know, built for strip malls and all that other crap. But there are so many good ones that show what architecture can do. Um, and when you see it on the inside, we do a lot of work in higher education. And that's a building type that really engages the users. Because students, faculty, administration all interact in those spaces and the activity levels that you see in a well-designed space uh, that really works well really shows off what architecture can do. What, do you, what innovations are you seeing right now in higher education? Oh, there's a, definitely a, a trend towards what we would call student-centered learning. So if you and I... As opposed to... A didactic, <laughs> we all sat in lecture halls. Um, or in classrooms of rows and tables, much like the elementary school and high school experience we had, um, uh, at least, you know, my generation, I think probably of your Mine generation too. as well. Um, we have seen a trend in the last 10 years towards team-based learning, much like an architectural studio. Um, I think that's the one thing I make a comment when we're working with, with schools of education and schools of science and engineering, um, is they're all starting to adapt the studio model that architecture has taught um, most of our career. Um, except for that art history class we had to take in the dark where they show the two images of <laughs> ancient Roman art or, you know, mid-century Renaissance or something. Um, but the, uh, so what's happening is uh, uh, these programs of two and three, well, actually with three to six person teams working on a project in class where they've actually taken the lecture online the night before. So it's, it's the flipped classroom. I don't know if you've heard that term, but the flipped classroom model is that I take my lecture online um, and I come to class and I do my homework in a team. And the homework is much like a lab experience where we're, we're actually doing a research, small research project within the hour, 90 minutes of the class time. And we, we present that at the end of the class to our other cohorts in the class. So the students are not only learning uh, app applied research, uh, cognitive thinking, they're learning how to communicate and present their findings to a group so they get more comfortable in standing in front of groups and presenting. Um, so it's a really unique experiential change in, in the learning model um, that we've seen st started about 10 years ago at North Car Carolina State um, and is now sweeping the country. We, can, we have not worked on a project in the last three years where that focus on student-centric learning and this change of classroom design is impacting um, classes everywhere. I just had a conversation yesterday with an architect in Minneapolis who's doing a university in Costa Rica. Um, and, and they have the same concept there. This, the, the schools that are working with the co local Costa Rica uh, adjacent university, as it's a US uh, University of Costa Rica collaboration, are wanting to model this, these active learning models that are happening in the US. And the reason why it's important, and, and it has a little less to do with architecture, though it does, uh, impact the architecture is it has greater student learning outcomes. Students are getting better grades um, and, and are performing at a higher level 
at a lower cost to the university because we're putting more students through programs. So, um, Fascinating. It, and, and, and it's changing. What's happening, though, is it's um, architecturally, it's spread. It's not just classroom buildings anymore. These kind of collaborative spaces are popping up in, in what used to be the library. It's now called the Learning Commons. So the books are becoming digitized. The physical books are are uh, are going away or being radically reduced or being archived with robotic systems to bring them up to the student if they need a physical book. Um, and the rest of the, of the library is now a place to go work with your team um, in a variety of ways that are media centric, that'll have Skype connections to experts we can call anywhere in the world um, and, uh, and places we can build media if you look at North Carolina State's J.B. Hunt Library, which was completed this year, it's a great example of that kind of space. Mm. Uh, really innovative, lots of technology. Um, if you're familiar with touchscreens, if you're using a touchscreen and you're on your tablet, take that and, and by steroids, blow it up to something that's 20 feet long and five feet high. And now I have an interactive multi-touch blackboard, effectively, where I can have four or five students working on a model um, on a screen that they can then share, save, and uh, uh, and present uh, to their uh, faculty and their and their friends. So it's incredible to get a picture of the future there. Yeah, Craig, I'm I'm looking I'm looking at my notes here, and I'm seeing a pattern of you being put in leadership positions from a very early age. You talk about how a few years in of working for the firm in L.A., you were promoted to run the office. Yeah. What would you say is it about your particular characteristics, the way you think, that suits you well for that kind of path? Well, um, thanks, Andy. I think that's uh, that's I've always I've I've looked at that too. I'm always amazed because somebody taps you on the shoulder and said, "Hey, we want you to go run LA." Um, and I and at the time, and I'll, you know, that was the first experience of that. I had been a project manager uh, out of school for this firm. And what did they run, yeah, What did they see in you that they didn't see in others? Right. And what they saw and they said was, you know, I was in a small office. We were 50 people. I was one of seven project managers managing multiple projects. And they said, um, you have the you have the best client relations based on referral work we have more of your clients coming back to us for more work than we have from any of the other uh any of the other project managers combined which was kind of an interesting and i was really not even self-aware that i was doing that i i thought and I, maybe it's work ethic or you know it's that beach i grew up at the beach in california it's that beach boy work <laughs> ethic. Yeah, let's go surfing um uh, no, but it was it was part of a. Uh, I was I'm always focused on providing value to our clients and responsiveness to me and maybe something my father taught me was if someone asks you for something and you're able to provide them with that information, don't wait, give them that information. So I always responsiveness has been a key part of my practice, but I've always focused on the value of that, and so I will take the time to do if I don't know something. Um, to do the research into that before I'll share. I think it's, you know, if they're coming to consultants, whether you're an architect or a, a consultant like us or an engineer, uh, for help. Um, and the more you can provide, and if you self-acknowledge you don't know, um, you can take the time and get smarter and share with them uh, relevant information. So those two things, responsiveness and valuable information, uh, have over the years been a characteristic. People said, we look to Craig as the guy who knows stuff. And I joke that in the, I've, I've been in the architectural field for all of my career, but I've also been in the technology side of the practice from all of my career. And I write, as you know, for a number of magazines, and I write for the technology magazines about marketing professional services, and I write for the marketing magazines about technology. Um, so uh, I've always had this sort of split personality of geek and strategist. Um, and I think Craig, that, how do you stay, how do you stay abreast to have so much valuable information? What do you do in your uh, personal life to make sure yeah. that you're on the cutting edge? I, I try and take, I try and carve at least an hour a day of doing web research or reading. I subscribe to a lot of journals. Um, I read, you know, I, I take an hour before I go to bed and read at night. Um, I'm in a voracious uh, consumer of information. doesn't mean I absorb it all, but I make notes and I, you know, I, I see what's applicable uh, to us, and I have a, I'm blessed with a good memory. I used to say I'm not really smart; I just have a great memory. <laughs> um, and uh, but the uh, but that part of it of of watching for the connections uh, uh, between new technology development and applications, 
we use in our practice, and I share this with our clients all the time, uh, there's a company out of Boston called the Gartner Consulting Group. And uh, Gartner does a lot of technology research, and I look at their stuff all the time. Um, and they have what's known as the tech hype curve. And so if you can imagine, so we can get this to draw on the screen, a curve that goes up like this and then comes down and drops off, is that the, something will be innovated new and get the media's attention. Uh, it'll rise to the top. Google's so you just black. illustrated for us, for those people who are listening, you illustrated a curve that goes up very sharply, peaks, and then comes down very sharply. Right, and then and then trails off over time. Okay, at, at a middle middle level. Okay, and um, and what happens is that someone will innovate something new. Google Glass is a good example, um, and all of a sudden it'll get a ton of media attention and be everywhere. And then someone will realize there actually isn't a real application for this yet. Uh, <laughs> it's cool, but and all of a sudden it'll hit that steep dive and go into what's known as the trough of disillusionment, um, uh, and it'll sit there until applications start to be developed where that technology is applicable and where that technology benefits the output of the result of that application. And that happens all the time. And we can look at um, Wi-Fi, gigabit Wi-Fi. Um, I don't know. I know, uh, at least for me, everywhere I go, the first thing I ask for is, what's your Wi-Fi address? Um, uh, five years ago, that wasn't the case. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't even, it wouldn't have been in your mind to say, how do I connect to the Wi-Fi system here? Um, so there's, we track all those technologies, virtual reality, hologra holo holography in architecture, I think is the really interesting coming um, technology uh, that will change the way we present and market our projects. When you can walk in with a, a 24 inch by 24 inch by quarter inch thick cube, look, square, that looks like a floor tile and shine a light on it and the model of the building appears much like Princess Leia did. I mean, ever since I saw Star Wars, Craig, I've been wanting that. <laughs> it, uh, zebraimaging.com in Austin, Texas, um, uh, has those available for architects today for about $3,000 per model. Mm. Uh, and it's an amazing technology and uh, very effective. I was part of a, a group of architects around the country that about six years ago beta tested their technology. So we did a half a dozen different project models uh, to show a building in this using this holographic photographic methodology. Um, and we had them in the office and we had them in the lobby. And so everybody would walk through and see them as they're way in and out. And I'll tell you, the architects in the practice looked at them and go, eh, not really ready for prime time. It's not as good as my little laser cut basswood model, you know, with the, uh, the sort of precious detail that goes into that. Um, it's kind of fuzzy. Um, it's color. I, I like that. Um, but and then the client walked in and the client's first, once their jaw got off the floor was <laughs> we, we want to buy one for our lobby to show our new building to our, our, our customers and our employees. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, and I, I will tell you, we won projects taking those. Uh, so still a, still a technology in development, uh, but a technology that has now starting to gain traction. And I think you'll see more of it. And where it's really interesting to me is that what we're doing right now will at one point be you and me as holograms talking to each other. You know, I have 10 years from now, this will be a holographic conversation. And, it'll, and it's much more real when mm -hmm. you see the three dimensions of someone. So, You mean I'll have to wear some presentable pants, Craig? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I'll have to wear pants. Okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, Craig, you so we talked a little bit about the kind of the secret to um, – being recognized as a leader, not for leadership's sake alone, but so you can give additional value to people and really live out your purpose in life. You know, one of the things you mentioned was responsiveness. You, you gave us some examples of some great examples of client satisfaction. Tell me a little bit about your personal um, code of responsiveness. Do you have a certain amount of time you like to respond to emails? How do you handle the inbox and the incessant ringing of the phone? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, and I will tell you, Today, more than ever before in our life, with between our computing, our phones, our cell phones, um, our tablets, we're connected in ways that we may not really appreciate how connected we are. Um, I have always had a, a policy that if I can respond to a client within four hours, I will. And if I can't, I will let them know within four hours. The response to their question will come within 24 hours. Um, and I, that, for me, has always been the easy rule. Because um, it's easy to say, I saw your, your question, 
Um, I can't get to this right now, but I will within the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's always been satisfying. A lesson I learned early on uh, with one of my mentors was uh, when we're working on a project with a client, if we know we're going to be late on a deliverable, tell them you know you're going to be late. Mm-hmm. Don't be late. I mean, you can be late, but you can only be late if you told them you're going to be late. Mm. If they come to you and say, hey, where's the stuff? You know, I thought it was due today. And you say, I'm still working on it. That, that You've lost trust. By establishing that proactive uh, responsiveness, you gain trust. And as you know, trust is the key to those to building a strong client relationship. Um, trust in, in the information you provide them. Trust in the way you respond to them. Trust in the in the information you provide them is relevant to them um, and meets their need. I think we as architects, as creatives, and I'll use the the, the global uh, design practices, um, really, you know, our 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 role in life is to be creative, is to come up with innovative solutions that will last, prove that you know the test of time. We're designing fifty year buildings today, uh, sometimes hundred year buildings, uh, if we're lucky. Um, and those buildings need to respond to change, um, and we need to think that way and communicate that way. It's not just a one-time deal, and we walk away when the punch list is done and enjoy your enjoy your building. We'll see you later. Um, it, you've hopefully built a lifetime relationship where, whether that client has another project or not, that client will be a referral to other clients who want to do something similar. Craig, I think that's a great place to end this particular episode. Okay. I know that we, I'd like to talk in the next episode, I'd like to talk about more kind of where you're getting right now in terms of the marketing and relationship building side of things, collaborating, and you have some great stories to tell there too. So I encourage right. everyone to tune into the next episode and Look forward as we to it. continue that conversation. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.